50 verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the temple and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbal. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, praise the Lord.
Well, as our uh, children's choir continues to uh, make their way to their seats, I wanted to start with thanking uh, the children for uh, leading us in worship. And also, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, Thanksgiving Day service, a blessed Thanksgiving Day to you all. Pray for God's blessing upon you and your families, that God's richest blessings and mercies would dwell richly upon you all. I think that's everybody. Let's begin our time together with our opening prayer. Let's pray together. Our Almighty God, we thank you for this day that you have made, for it is a day of thanksgiving and praise. It is a day in which we rejoice in the blessings that you have given to us, that you have shown to us, not only in creation, but in our redemption. So may it be, O Lord, that in this hour of worship, your name would be glorified, that you would receive the thanksgiving and praise, because you, our Heavenly Father, are the fountain and source of every good and perfect gift. So we thank you for this time set apart that we not only as a nation, but particularly as a people would pause and give you thanks. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Our call to worship comes to us from Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is our rock eternal. Receive now God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn together for our opening hymn of praise. We're going to be singing together the words of Psalm 98. We heard these words for our call to worship. 98C, 98C, sing a new song to Jehovah, 98C. We now have the opportunity to have the senior choir leading us, and they're going to be singing 
number 551, and the congregation is going to be joining us and singing uh, verse 3. So the senior choir is going to be leading us in song, We Plow the Field, 551, 551, the congregation joining in verse 3. Let's come together to our Lord in our Thanksgiving Day prayer. Let's pray together. Our Almighty God and Father of all mercies, we as your unworthy servants do not give you the thanks that you deserve, but we do this day give you hearty thanks for all the goodness and loving kindness shown to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, 
We thank you for the sun, moon, and stars which you have set in place. We thank you for your preservation, that all things come to us from your hand and are worked for our good and your glory, that nothing happens by chance, but indeed everything comes to us from a loving Father. We thank you for all of the blessings of this life, strength and health, but above all, we thank you for your wondrous love shown to us in the redemption secured for us by Jesus Christ. We thank you as our Heavenly Father that in your love you, have gave, you gave to us your only begotten Son. We thank you that Jesus in his love laid down his life for the sheep. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness that you have brought us into your fold. We thank you for the means of grace by which we might know you, that we might hear your word and we might see your grace made visible in baptism and the Lord's Supper. We thank you for the hope that you have stirred within our heart. We thank you for the joy of your salvation. We thank you not only for Jesus Christ, but for your Spirit who dwells richly and fully in our hearts. We thank you for the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. We thank you for the Spirit's work of bringing to mind all that Christ said and did. We thank you that the Spirit impresses upon us and applies to us the grace and riches, the mercies that Christ has secured. So we thank you, O Lord for all of the blessings, and we pray that our hearts this day would be opened, that we would be stirred, that we would once again stand in awe of the great things that you have done for us, for the covenant that you have made with us and our children, that you would be our God and we would be your people. May we live our lives in response to this truth. As we think this day on Thanksgiving, At the end of the harvest season, we thank you for the sunshine and the rain. We thank you for the seed and the harvest. We pray that you would grant to us each day our daily bread. Fill our cups with water and our mouth with food so that we might have the strength to praise you. And when we are fed, may we acknowledge you as the fountain and source of every good and perfect gift, the giver of these good gifts. We rejoice in the beauty diversity, and abundance in creation. We ask that you would neither give us poverty nor riches, but we ask that you would give us what we need, what is necessary. And being filled, may we turn to you again and acknowledge you as the giver of these good gifts. May we, like the Israelites in the desert, Rise each morning looking to your hand for manna and thanking you not only for physical gifts but for spiritual gifts, even Jesus Christ our Lord, that life-giving bread. We do again thank you for the protection that you have given to the farmers in our midst and in our communities. We thank you that you have blessed us as a church with children. We thank you, O Lord, for the blessings that we have in this nation in which we dwell. We pray that the hearts of those in this world, in this nation, would be turned to you, that we would not, as a people, have hearts that are proud, that we would not think it is by our own wisdom or the strength of man that we can provide for our daily needs, but rather that we would acknowledge that if left to ourselves, if by our own strength we depended, indeed we would all fail and fall. For we have neither the wisdom or the strength to cause the seed to produce a harvest And even if we were to to gain the world and yet lose our soul, indeed, how much we would lose. 
So we pray for your protection upon us in this day, those who will be traveling as we spend time with family and friends. We do pray that in the the busyness of this season, we would not be filled with a spirit of consumerism, a wanting and craving, but rather that we would have a spirit of contentment, knowing that godliness with contentment is great gain. May we rather focus on what we have received and what you have given instead of focusing on what we want and what we desire. For we know that in the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure. They will work towards the the pursuit of the the physical things and ignore the spiritual things. May this never be true. May this never be evident in our lives. But rather, may we store up our treasures, not in this world, but in the world to come. May we seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness, knowing that you will add all these other things to us. For the birds of the heavens are given a nest by your hand. The flowers of the field are clothed in raiment, in garments more beautiful than Solomon. If you provide for the birds of the heavens and the grass of the field, will you not surely provide for us, your children? So we do, O Lord, look to your hand. When times are well, may we be thankful and grateful. When times are difficult, may we be patient. And for the future, may we trust in you, looking to your hand each day. We do again thank you for this day that we can praise and thank you. And as we continue our time together and read your word, we pray that your word would be impressed upon us, that we would be filled with a joy and a thanksgiving, which is is fitting for us as your people, the sheep of your pasture and the flock under your care. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We now sing together our hymn of preparation. We're going to be singing from our red a songbooks, Red Trinity songbooks, number 95C. 95C. We'll stand and sing, Now with joyful exaltation, let us sing to God our praise. 95C, let's stand and sing together.
Before we read our text in uh, Psalm 95, we're going to be having a responsive reading, so let's turn in our black uh, pew Bibles, the back of our black pew Bibles, be reading section 18 and section 20, a responsive reading of thanksgiving, so that's found on page 1248, 1248 in the back of our uh, black pew Bibles. You find two very fitting responsive readings of thanksgiving. So again, this page 1,248, uh, section 18, first from Psalm 67. Let's respond together with the bolded words, and then we'll jump to section 20 from Psalm 100. So first, let's read from section 18, Psalm 67, responding with the bold together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let the ends of the earth fear him. And then down to uh, section 20, Psalm 100, the bottom of the same page here. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And that's as far as we're reading in our responsive reading. Then we're going to be turning uh, to Psalm 95, Psalm 95 for our text. Psalm 95 for the text, our Thanksgiving Day uh, text is going to be Psalm 95. We're going to be reading the entirety of the psalm together. And Psalm 95 is found on page 590, 590. Psalm 95, again, this page 590. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. I do encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we look at Psalm 95 together this morning. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have gathered it together as a day set apart specifically for Thanksgiving, for singing songs of praise, but I'm not sure if this applies to you, but it seems to me every year Thanksgiving uh, sort of creeps up on you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, someone from our church asked me, uh, Pastor Alonzo, what are you planning on preaching on for Thanksgiving? 
for Christmas. And I said, Christmas? I haven't even thought of Thanksgiving yet, uh, much less uh, Christmas. Every year, it seems to be, Thanksgiving sneaks up uh, upon us. Uh, a national annual day of Thanksgiving uh, was instituted by Abraham Lincoln many years ago, but the fact remains, it is good for us to be reminded to set apart a day for Thanksgiving, a day for praise. You will remember that one of the first acts that Adam and Eve did after the fall was to run away from God. The most core, the most, the most pressing, the most visible way in which sin is seen in mankind is when instead of running to God to give him praise, instead of wanting, wanting to be in his presence to worship and bow down, man in his sin runs away, flees, and hides. The sinful response, the sinful nature of man is to refuse to give God the glory that he deserves. The act of thanksgiving is something that we are called to do, something that Christ calls us to do as a church, something that is restored to us by the Spirit, so that we not only have the ability to enter into the most holy place, you remember that Jesus Christ has opened the way for us, that curtain that barred the way has been torn in two. We not only have access, Jesus gives us the ability to come. By his Spirit, we have the strength to come. We have the desire to come. Why are you here today? Why didn't you sleep in late this morning? Why didn't you stay home babysitting your turkey? Why are you here today? You are here because God has given you the ability and the desire to worship God. To give him the praise, to give him the glory, to give him thanks because you acknowledge. Because you are able to see, your eyes can perceive the truth. that God has richly blessed us once again this past year. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to see the truth that Jesus Christ has truly blessed us. Well, as we look at Psalm 95 under the heading, uh, Psalm of Thanksgiving, we're going to see that Psalm 95 is not only a call to praise, a call to thanksgiving, it is also a historical psalm. It builds upon Israel's history and uses what the Israelites did as a negative example showing the human tendency to default towards complaint instead of defaulting towards praise. And isn't that true? Maybe I should ask the parents here. Isn't that true that it is our human nature, particularly evident when we are blessed, instead of giving thanks, instead of defaulting in gratitude, we default to complain. But God stirs our hearts once again to give glory to our God and give him the worship that he deserves. Our psalm begins then, the, our psalm is, is roughly divided into two sections. The first section is the call to worship. So our psalm begins with a call made to the congregation that they must come, they must gather, and they must worship. Notice in Psalm 95 the corporate, the corporate invitation. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. There is a, not only repeated, but there is a communal, corporate call. Come as God's people. Again, repeated in verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. This psalm is not saying you should stay home by yourself and in your personal prayers, praise God, which is good, which is necessary. But this psalm says the church of Jesus Christ gathers together for worship. There is a corporate calling to this command. Gather together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, singing your songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do not forsake the gathering of God's people. Come together with the bride. Gather together as the body of Christ. Recognizing our corporate blessings. 
Again and again, we have this repeated and this corporate call. As God's people, we are not alone in the task of giving praise. We are surrounded by this uh, innumerable host. We have uh, angels and festive garments that gather with us when we worship. And as Hebrews 12 says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. There is a, a blessing that we have in stirring each other up. I know sometimes we may not feel like worshiping. Sometimes our hearts may be hard or sullen or cold. Yet when we gather together with God's people, we are stirred up. We are fanned into flame by the presence of each other. So let this just be a parting application. When you don't feel like worship, worship is where you exactly need to be. Because when you gather with God's people, you are hearing that call and you are hearing the songs of your brothers and sisters stirring you up. Come and worship. David would say, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So we gather together to worship. There is a corporate command, but there is also a, a committed command. This, the Hebrew here is speaking of a, of a, a hurried sense, a, a necessity. Come, let us. It is not only an invitation, but it is a command that is impressed upon us by God himself. It's not just a good idea. It's not just come when you feel like it. It is come and worship. It is an important and urgent matter. When God's people gather together for worship, we're not just doing what is a good idea or what we think should happen. We are doing what we are committed to because God says, this is important. What you do at church with God's people is important. It is obeying the command of God who calls you to worship. It is not a choice that you are free to make, to take or leave at your discretion. It is impressed upon you. It is the proper response of those who have faith to come and worship. It is a rebellious sheep that hears the voice of the good shepherd and chooses to go their own way. It is an obedient sheep that hears the voice and comes. But what are we coming to do? Verse 2 says we are coming to give thanks. Coming to sing. Coming to, to express your gratitude. To make a joyful noise to the Lord. Singing your praise with songs and prayer. Recognizing the great things God has done as you rejoice. There's even a, a sense of loud shouting, a loud noise, celebrating God's greatness. How do we praise God? We praise God with our prayer. We praise God with our song. We praise God with our worship. We praise God by obeying. Do we not offer our lives as a living sacrifice of praise? So all of our life, and particularly in worship, we are giving him the glory and giving him the praise. But why should we worship? In addition to the commandment, we find the one who gives the command as a reason for worship. The first, worship we should, the first reason we should worship, found in verse 3, is we should worship for the Lord is God. The most foundational and necessary reason to praise God is because God is God. You are a creature. He is the creator. He has the divine right to tell you to be here. And he has every expectation that he will get the praise because of who he is. Giving thanks is the expected response of a creature to his creator. But not only is he God, he is the great God. Verse 4 and 5. He is the great God who made everything, who holds everything. 
sun, moon, and stars set in their place. The sea, the earth, and everything in it, God has made. He holds the the depths of the earth in his hand. Isaiah talks about the Lord being able to measure the ocean in the palm of his hand. That the, the islands are like dust on the scale. The nations are like a drop of condensation that forms on the outside of the bucket. So small and insignificant compared to the greatness of our God. Who can tell God, you can't do that, God? Can we tell God what he can and cannot do? If God sets his mind, his will, his his desire to do something, will he not do it? Nothing is impossible for our God. If we served a weak God, would we have a reason to praise him? No, we serve a strong God, his mighty hand and outstretched arm, delivered his people up out of Egypt. Pharaoh can whine and complain all he wants. He's not going to stop God from saving his people. Satan can battle against Christ, go to war against Christ's people, but the gates of hell will not prevail because our God is a great God and he can do it. But he is not only a great God, he is our God. Verse 7, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his hand. As wonderful and necessary as it is for all creatures to acknowledge God as the fountain, as the source, as the creator, as the provider and sustainer, there is an added emphasis here in this psalm about the identity of his people. We are his people. He is our God. There is a covenantal connection He has placed his name, his seal, his affection upon you. You are the apple of his eye. He loved you so much that he gave the most precious thing, the most expensive thing. The most expensive thing that a father can give would be his own child. And that's what our father did. He has adopted us in Jesus Christ. We are his sheep, his children. He embraces us. He calls us his own, calls us out of the darkness, draws us to himself. So when we are thinking, when we are looking, pondering for reasons to praise God, you can look at creation and you can look at redemption. He is the creator, the Elohim, the great God, the mighty God who speaks all things into existence. He spoke in the beginning and there was nothing but void and darkness. And he called light and life and stars and planets and this earth. And filled all these things, filled the earth and the heavens with life. But he also has a special care for us and for our salvation. Knowing us before the foundation of the world. This rightly moves us, motivates us, compels us to come and worship. But the problem is, human nature, fallen man, doesn't always listen. The second second half of of our psalm focuses on the absence of worship. As compelling as it is, many reasons, multitude of reasons to give thanks to God, the second half of our psalm focuses on the fact that God often does not get the praise that he deserves. Like rebellious sheep that close their ears to the voice of the shepherd, failing to heed the commandment and call. Verse 8 says, the end of verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There are many who hear the audible call. There are people who have been 
born in covenant homes, raised in a Christian church, heard the call to faith and repentance, heard the call to worship again and again and again, and hardened their hearts. I do not want this man to be my king. I will not give the covenantal Lord the glory that he deserves. So like Adam and Eve in the, in the wilderness, in the, in the garden, fleeing into the wilderness, running from the presence of God, refusing to give God the glory that he deserves. The psalmist ends this psalm by warning the Israelites and by extension warning us, don't be ungrateful. Don't be unmoved. Don't harden your heart. Don't have a stiff neck. Don't close your ears. Don't turn a deaf ear when God calls you and commands you to worship. Don't be like that hard soil, that packed soil. Remember the parable of Jesus? The parable of the sower? Cast the seed. Some of that seed falls on the path. It's been trampled down by the feet of men and the carts that have passed over it. That seed sits there on the top of the soil and the bird comes and snatches that seed. The devil comes and takes the word away and that seed produces no fruit. Hard heart. Unreceptive soil. This rebellion carries a specific and serious consequence. Verse 8 continues, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness. Here the psalmist is referencing an event from Numbers 20. In Numbers 20, you have the Israelites who are on the cusp of taking possession of the promised land. And there is a, a direct link to everything that has just happened as the promised land stands in their vision, in their range of sight. They can see it. It's right there. Now, what have the Israelites just experienced? Well, the Israelites have just experienced redemption. God brought them out of the house of bondage. He brought that mighty host out of Egypt. It is these people who saw the ten plagues, the signs and wonders performed upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his officials, seeing the land of Egypt turned to dust and rubble and nothing but ashes and death. They saw the firstborn in Egypt dying and yet their own lives being spared. The Passover lamb, his blood has been shed. They passed through the waters of the Red Sea. They were baptized into Moses. That water of destruction and death has been parted by God's hand and mighty arm. They saw it with their own eyes and they saw the Egyptians go into the water and the water returning to its place and their enemies being snuffed out, extinguished like a candle blown out by the wind. And then that 40 years of wandering, their sandals didn't wear out. They had food every day, manna every morning. God provided for them and protected them and sustained them through their years of wandering in the wilderness. And now here they come to Meribah and Massa. Massa means testing. Meribah means strife. They come to water and the water is bitter, is bad. There's no water there that they can drink. One of the last stops before coming to Sinai, their hearts faded and failed. They desired to have water, and they blamed God, and they even blamed Moses. Why have you brought us here? Have you brought us into the wilderness just so that we can die? Are there no graves in Egypt? Why did you bring us out of bondage? We were so much better there. We had pots 
full of flesh. We could eat all the meat that we wanted and the gourds. Think of the gourds, the watermelons and things that we... It was so much better there, Moses. Why did you bring us out, God? Why didn't you leave us in bondage? And they complained against the Lord and his anointed. What they did is they forgot all the Lord had done. Focusing on this one situation and forgetting the context of grace. So what happened? That generation was put to death because they rebelled. They went astray in their hearts. They died in the wilderness. Sometimes the church is plagued with some trial and we forget what the Lord has done. Sometimes in our personal lives, something comes up and it looms large in our vision. Some hardship, some health difficulty, financial hardship, some relational friction. And we forget God's blessings. We can't see beyond this one event. We want water. There's no water here. We forget how many years God has faithfully protected and provided for us. We start to grumble. We start to argue. We start to complain. We start to murmur. Where's the God of our forefathers now? Has he forsaken me? And when God does shine upon us in his favor once again, we receive the blessing and go merrily on our way, forgetting to give God thanks for the answered prayers. You'll remember in Luke 17 that Jesus healed the ten lepers and only one returned to thank the Lord. The fact is there are events that happen in our lives. Sometimes the events are, are such blessings that we start to assume we deserve them and we have pride in our own works. But more often it's a time of hardship, a time of trial, tribulation, and testing. And we start to question whether or not God would be faithful. But as our church will remember... Like Job, we can receive from the Lord's hand both good and ill, and yet we praise the Lord. The things of this world are, are temporary, they're passing. Job acknowledged this. Born naked, we die naked, can't take anything with us. Yet our life is called to be a constant hymn of praise. Paul will write this in one of his letters. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't be worried. Don't let your heart be troubled and filled with, with concerns and cares, but rather, in everything, with your prayers, with your petitions, make them with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is to be that constant refrain of the Christian's heart. Because circumstances change, situations change, but our God remains the same. And that's the very thing that we find in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, those created by God refused to give thanks to God, and it is this ingratitude that is rebuked by God as foolishness. So our psalm ends with a rebuke of the Lord. If having tasted that the Lord is good, if having seen his wondrous works performed for you, and you aren't moved, if your heart remains like stone, If you fail to give God the thanks and praise and gratitude that, is, that he's worthy of, 
The psalmist says, beware lest you taste God's wrath. Verse 10 through 11 says that God swore judgment upon that generation. Because they began their wilderness and traveling those 40 years, they began it by complaining. And they ended it in the wilderness. That generation died buried in the desert. Because of their lack of gratitude, they never were able to enter the promised land. Because of their lack of faith, they never passed over the Jordan. This almost reminds us that there is a call, that there is a commandment, that we should give thanks and praise, but also warns us of the dangers of ingratitude. So particularly this time of year, Thanksgiving kind of marks the, uh, tomorrow's Black Friday, marks the beginning of the season of consumerism, a season of materialism. Beware lest you fall into the trap that the Israelites fell into. Beware lest your heart be found ungrateful. Rather, may we all together be stirred to bring our songs, hymns, spiritual songs with thanksgiving to the Lord for the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. To conclude, the call to worship being proclaimed today is to be received with a heart of faith. Those who do not praise God because of who God is, those who do not know God as the great God and the covenantal God, those who do not acknowledge him as the loving Father who has secured us, adopted us by way of Jesus Christ, Those who don't have gratitude stand in line for judgment. The warning is echoed in Hebrews 3, verse 15. Those who harden their hearts, who heard the voice of the shepherd, who received the call to worship but did not respond, died in their sins. So our God is uniting the church. The true church is united in praise. The true church is united in thanksgiving. So may we hear, come, worship, and give thanks. The church must respond by giving God the glory that he deserves. Because the fact is, thanksgiving is the door by which we enter into God's presence. Gratitude is the key that opens the gate of worship. So let us come and worship, entering his presence with thanksgiving today. Even in our prayers, in our singing, and in offering our lives as a living sacrifice of praise. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this stirring reminder of the necessity of praise. And even though we are far too often unconcerned, uncaring. Far too often our hearts are cold. Our praise is lacking in motivation. By your Spirit, stir us again this day to see the reason why we must praise. Because you are God, you are the great God, and you are our God. May our redemption that we have in Jesus Christ move us as your sheep to praise you as you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of response is number 553. 553, we'll stand and sing 553.
As the deacons are coming forward to receive our tithes and offering, our special offering is for the Lansing Food Pantry. And after that, we'll stand and sing the doxology, Come Ye Thankful People Come. It's printed here uh, in our bulletins. We'll sing stanzas 1, 2, and 4 of 552.
as you now depart on this Thanksgiving day, go forth with God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.